Let's take our Bibles tonight and instead of Exodus chapter 4, let's go to Isaiah chapter 26, if you would please. I've uh, been thinking about this verse uh, actually for several days uh, last week uh, and I was planning on preaching this, uh, this past Sunday night, but uh, had a little change there with uh, Jacob preaching and, and uh, we'll look at this tonight. And uh, there's, uh, there, there's some great, great verses in the Bible, obviously. Uh, this, is, this is one of them that I want us to think about uh, tonight. Do be praying for the Hennais family. And uh, I guess, I don't know who all was here when, uh, you know, we mentioned the uh, uh, result of the vote on Sunday night. But it was 85% uh, approving them to come. And uh, we've asked Jacob if he'd let us know by this coming Sunday what uh, their decision is on that. So uh, hopefully we'll have that uh, for you uh, then. All right, and do pray for the uh, Montes as well. Uh, Brother Monteith was planning on going down uh, to Tennessee on tomorrow uh, to see the new grandbaby, but uh, was able to get everything done that he needed to do and uh, left uh, Tuesday night. And uh, got there, I think, around midnight or so uh, this morning. Uh, so uh, they're there. So remember them uh, during this time as well. Isaiah chapter 26 and one verse. And uh, we'll be looking at several others as well. But uh, this, this one verse in particular. Verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we're grateful for this opportunity that you have afforded us to gather together and to look into your word. And Lord, thank you for this verse and for the promise that we have uh, from you in this verse. And I pray that you'd help us to uh, trust uh, in this promise. And Lord, I pray that this would be more of a reality in our lives. Uh, we live in a world that is so characterized and dominated by doubt and uh, conflict uh, on every level. And uh, Lord, there are uh, folks that uh, crave peace uh, in their hearts. Lord, we know that you're the source of that and we thank you for that. And I pray that you'd bless our time as we consider uh, these truths tonight. And may Christ be magnified in us and through us and uh, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth uh, in our hearts tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at the verse again. If uh, you have never committed this verse to memory, this would certainly be one of the verses uh, in the Word of God that would be good to memorize. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Uh, W.E. Blackstone was uh, one of the great British statesmen back in uh, another century. And he had on the wall of his bedroom this text, this, this verse here. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That was the first thing that he saw uh, when he got up of the morning and the last thing that he laid his eyes on when he went to bed at night. And it's said that he testified that that verse uh, was one of the sources of uh, his calm strength uh, that he had in his life. P.P. P. Bliss, one of the great hymn writers, and if that name doesn't ring a bell with you, uh, just in, in our hymn book, there are several uh, hymns that P.P. P. Bliss wrote, Almost Persuaded, uh, was written by him. Dare to be a Daniel was uh, penned by P.P. P. Bliss. Hallelujah, tis done, uh, he wrote. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Think about that. P.P. Uh, P. Bliss wrote that. Let the Lord lights be burning. Jesus loves even me. Uh, one of my favorites, Once for All, P.P. P. Bliss wrote, uh, The light of the world is Jesus. Wonderful words of life, he wrote. Uh, I gave my life for thee, my Redeemer. And then probably the most famous uh, hymn 
uh, that he wrote was, It is well with my soul. He didn't put that to music. H.G. Spafford did that. Uh, but uh, P.P. Bliss penned the words to that. And uh, here's what he said about this just a simple statement. He said, I love this verse more than any other verse in the Bible. Uh, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now, <clears throat> that's not a promise of uh, freedom from trouble. It's not a promise of freedom from difficulty. It's not a promise of freedom from conflict. Uh, life is going to bring all of that, isn't it? Amen. But this is a promise from God that in the midst of all of that and even more, there is the possibility, again, finding its source in God Himself and, and relying upon the promise that God makes that there can be what he describes here as perfect peace. You know, I think even as believers sometimes, we sort of come to a verse like that and uh, we think, really? Is that possible? Surely God's exaggerating there. Uh, with, with all the difficulty that I'm facing in my life, uh, there's no way I can have perfect peace. Well, then I guess that would make God dishonest, wouldn't it? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And that perfect peace refers to ease, rest in the heart. And uh, that, that's, that's where it is important anyway, isn't it? Uh, in, in a person's heart. One of the old commentators uh, wrote this, and he begins by referring to John 14, another familiar verse. Uh, or a f familiar passage, I should say. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. It is perfectly quiet at the center of the whirlwind. Jesus Christ is the center of the whirlwind of modern controversy. And while our lame interpretations of the universe, our little systems of philosophy put forth with so much pride and hope are being driven about and driven away like the shaft of the summer threshing floor, with Christ at the center, reason finds lasting quiet. Boy, that's all dependent upon the Lord Jesus, isn't it? Uh, Isaiah 9 and verse 6 reminds us that He is the Prince of Peace. We think about that verse normally at Christmas time, but He says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's your Savior. That's my Savior. Uh, and, and His peace that He desires to give is not limited by dispensation. Uh, in Isaiah 26, that is talking about, if you look at the context, that's referring to the future millennial reign of Christ. Uh, but this peace He gives now. He can give now. He desires to give now. And uh, it, it's, it's there for us, based upon His promise, centered in Christ. In uh, Psalm 85 and verse 8, the psalmist said this, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace unto His people and to His saints, and let them not turn again to folly. John 16 and verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace, Jesus said. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so God promises peace. He promises perfect peace. And uh, don't forget, He is the only one that can make such a promise. Amen. He's the only one that can provide such a promise. And we can, we'll see more about that in a little bit. But uh, uh, keep, keep, keep this in mind as you think about this great promise of Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Uh, the opposite of that, of that perfect peace, would be trouble. It would be distress. 
It would be uh, conflict. Uh, and and that, that can come from all kinds of sources. You've, you've no doubt faced uh, discouragement and distress and trouble in your life. And in all probability, uh, you have discovered that uh, it, it, it comes from no single source. It can come from various places. I was thinking about what the Bible would reveal to us about that. One would be this. Uh, circumstances can be the uh, source of great distress and trouble. Jacob would be an example of that. In Genesis chapter 42 and verse 36, this is after uh, his sons come back from Egypt after their journey down there to find food. And uh, Joseph sends them back, you remember, with the message that they're supposed to bring Benjamin. And uh, they tell Jacob their father that. And here's what he says in Genesis 42 and verse 36. Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you will take away ben and you will take Benjamin away. And then he says this: All these things are against me. Have you ever been to the place in your life when you've thought that? All these things are against me. Uh, Jacob, he wasn't a perfect man, but he certainly loved God at this point in his life, especially. And uh, he came to the place to where his conclusion was all. These things are against me. Were they? We know they were not. His perception was that they were. But you see, that was not a, a statement of faith there when, Joseph, when uh, Jacob said that. All these things are against me. He later learned that in reality, uh, those things were not against him. Uh, and he was able to see Joseph before he died. He thought he was dead here at this point. And uh, that's one reason why he said all these things are against me. The circumstances that he found himself in. He thought he had lost his son, Joseph. Now they were wanting to take Benjamin away. And so his circumstances produced this anxiety. Uh, produced this this uh, distress and conflict in him. And later on in Genesis, in chapter 50, uh, we learn from Joseph that God was working in all of those circumstances. Now that doesn't mean that God was the author of the sin that Joseph's brothers were guilty of in uh, lying to their father and so forth, selling Joseph to the Midianites and all that was involved in that. God, God did not sanction that of course. But God did work through all of those things and that that Jacob perceived to be against him uh, as far as God was concerned was really for him. And Joseph says this in chapter 50 and verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God, he's talking to his brothers, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. And boy, that made all the difference in the world. Uh, so uh, our circumstances. And then an amazing how much time we spend worrying and fretting and uh, getting all uh, anxious over so many things that we have no control over whatsoever. And the circumstances can be that way sometimes, can't they? Can't control them. But in the midst of all of that, even in the midst of circumstances that would appear uh, to be against us, like Jacob thought those were, uh, there can be peace that God gives. Uh, that doesn't come from our... You know, if we, if we only have peace when all of the circumstances are favorable to us, then uh, that really is a false peace, isn't it? Because in reality, what our faith is being placed in would be those favorable circumstances. And they can change within an hour, can't they? <laughs> uh, and, and God never changes. And we'll see uh, more about that here in just a minute. So circumstances 
uh, can, can rob us of that peace. And instead of peace, we can let our circumstances take us to the place of distress and anxiety. Uh, I thought about Peter as well. Uh, he experienced that same uh, truth when he uh, focused on his circumstances. Uh, walking on the water towards Jesus there in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 30. And you're, you're familiar with it. It says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And so uh, Peter's circumstances, I, 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 in a way they were good. He was walking on water uh, towards Christ, looking to Christ. But that was in the midst of a storm and uh, howling winds, waves crashing uh, against the boat. And uh, when, when he changed his focus from Christ to the boisterous wind, that's when he began to sink. And so we've got to be careful about our circumstances, don't we? That we uh, are, are not focused upon them. And then there, there's another area in which a lot of times uh, we find our, our peace uh, being, being hindered or uh, I should say uh, this as well uh, in, 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 instead of peace we have trouble and, and anxiety and all those things I mentioned before and the sad fact is uh, sometimes people contribute to that don't they think about David First Samuel chapter 30 and verse 1, It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. Look, was there any peace there then? Not at that time. David was greatly distressed. Why? Well, not... not only because of what had happened with the Amalekites and uh, everybody being carried away by the Amalekites. But read on, it says, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That's an amazing testimony concerning David. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now, keep in mind that these were men that had followed David. Uh, they had stood with him. They had stood by him. They had fought with him. Fought for him. They had put their lives on the line for him. And now what were they doing? They were talking of stoning him. That'd make anybody greatly distressed, wouldn't it? But what did David do? He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Uh, he, he was on his way to having that great distress that he was experiencing at that time to being replaced with a peace from God. And you think about it, and if you go back a few chapters in 1 Samuel there, you'll notice if you compare a couple of verses, this, this reflects a tremendous change in David's thinking. Back in chapter 27 and verse 1, and uh, we don't have time to go into all of that now, but you remember that Saul was out to kill David. I mean, he was relentless in his pursuit of David to kill him. And uh, we read about that in those chapters. And in chapter 27 and verse 1, David came to the place... Uh, to where he made uh, this decision. David said in his heart, chapter 27 and verse 1, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's going to come a day when Saul's going to kill me. He's going to end up catching me. And uh, 
He, he's going to take my life. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. Now David was in a predicament, wasn't he? He was running for his life daily. And again, he came to that conclusion, if I don't uh, do something, if I don't leave the coast of Israel and go down to the Philistines, then surely Saul, that's the only way uh, my life is going to be spared. Now, that was not a good decision on David's part. It says there in chapter 27, verse 1, he said, in his heart. That's where all that came from. And when our thinking is not focused and fixed on the Lord, our decisions and our actions coming from such thinking can take us down the wrong path. And it often does, doesn't it? And so David made that decision back in chapter 27 and verse 1, but now... In chapter 30 and verse 6, and, and this really is, in my thinking, this is a worse situation that he found himself in than fleeing from Saul. His own men, his own soldiers were now talking about stoning him. They, they were turning against him. And what did David do? He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I believe Psalm, not Psalm, but Isaiah 26 and verse 3 uh, would certainly be applied to what David did there. Thou wilt. He was getting his mind back in uh, tune, in line with what God desired in his life. Not, uh, not, not thinking in his own heart and coming to his own decision about what would be best for him, but relying upon God. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And I believe 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6 indicates that David was doing that very thing. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And you and I need to do the same thing. Uh, let, let's not get our focus off the Lord. Let's stay, uh, let, let's, as, as the verse says, let's stay on him. There's another uh, area in our lives that uh, can produce anxiety and trouble and, and uh, conflict and so forth. And that's self. This is probably our biggest robber of peace. Self. Paul spoke like this in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 beginning there. He said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Boy, that's a conflict, isn't it? And, 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 and Paul experienced that, and Paul... Uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God writes about it now. He says in verse 20, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring. No peace there, is there? Not, not during that warfare, not in that conflict, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Then listen to what he says. O wretched man that I am. It wasn't his circumstances that caused that. It wasn't other people that caused that. It was self. Specifically that old sinful nature that Paul was struggling with. And he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know his answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Victory in Paul's life 
was centered in staying focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of that uh, spiritual conflict between the old nature and the new nature. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That's an important word. Stayed on thee. That, uh, that certainly doesn't, doesn't refer to thinking about him every now and then, does it? And uh, I realize, you know, we have jobs and we, we got to focus on our job and other things. That, I, I understand that. I'm not suggesting that uh, you never think about uh, things like that at all. But the regular, daily uh, focus of our lives should be upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is the steadfast mind. I mean steadfast. That will keep him in perfect peace. Not, uh, you know, if he thinks about the Lord Jesus Christ on Sunday morning on the way to church or while at church, who stayed, whose mind is stayed on thee. And it's steadfast because it is focused and fixed upon him. And here's what I referred to earlier, him who is unchanging. That, 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 that's God. He's unchanging and he cannot be changed. Can you think of anything else, anyone else, uh, that you could possibly fix your mind upon and stay focused upon that is not subject to change at some point? There's no, nobody else. Uh, I mean, you think about the most consistent person in your life that you may have looked up to and uh, looked at as an example or whatever. Uh, they may have been consistent ever since uh, you, you started being influenced by them, but one day they're going to die. That's a change, isn't it? Uh, that, that, that's just one example. That, that's not going to happen to the Lord. Obviously, He did die once, but His death was uh, but for three days. And then He rose victoriously over death. And He is not subject to death anymore. He is not subject to change. Uh, no, no way. And, and so if there were no other reason for us as believers to stay fixed and focused upon Christ, it's because He is the unchanging one. Psalm 57 and verse 7 says, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. He repeats it. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Could we make that same claim, give that same testimony? My heart is fixed. Alexander McLaren, great Scottish preacher, said the possession of this deep, unbroken peace does not depend on the absence of conflict, of distraction, trouble, or sorrow, but on the presence of God. And boy, that's what we need to be zeroed in on it and focused on. Upon Him we must be stayed. That will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Uh, then He says, because He trusteth in thee. Uh, we're fixed. We're focused, we're stayed upon Him, or we should be, because we trust in Him. Now being confident, uh, this, this trust is, is being confident of and resting in the truth that God uh, does not, that God cannot do wrong. Would you be able to have perfect peace if you were putting your trust in a God that... There, somewhere out there, there's a possibility that uh, he can mess up and do wrong. That, that, you're not going to have perfect peace in that. But you can have perfect peace in this God who will... Uh, he is not subject 
to that possibility. There is no flaw in his person. There's no blemish in his character. There is no shortcoming in his nature. And, and, and you and I would fall short in all of those areas. But not him. And therefore, he is, he, he is a worthy object of our faith. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. Do we trust in him? I know we say we do. Uh, Job put it this way, chapter 13 and verse 15. And boy, I tell you, uh, you read this, you wonder whether you know anything about trusting God. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Job, Job was of the mindset that if God chose to slay him, Job basically is saying that's the right decision. That, that, that's the perfect decision and that is not going to sway or diminish my trust in him whatsoever. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And our trust must be in him. Not in some program, not in some system, but in Christ the Lord. First Chronicles 5 and verse 20. And I wish we had time to look at the context of all of these verses, but we don't. But in First Chronicles 5 and 20, it says, And they were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their hand. This, the Israel, talking about Israel. And all that were with them, for they cried to God in the battle, and he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him. Now Israel didn't always do that, did they? But here in this occasion they did, and what did it result in? It resulted, it resulted in victory for them. In 2 Chronicles 13 and verse 18, Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah, this is when Judah and Israel were in conflict, the two nations, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. It says, The children of, Israel, uh, the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. Uh, in chapter 16 and verse 18, 2 Chronicles, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. In Psalm 9 and verse 10, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 once again. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And wherever else we may focus and fix our minds, uh, that's going to bring disappointment. Anything other than Christ, anyone other than Christ you're going to be disappointed. We're going to have disillusionment, possibly, probably distress like David did because all else is imperfect and, and changeable as we said. Only God is not. Therefore, uh, he, he is able to set himself forth. It would be the height of arrogance for us to do that uh, and really blasphemy. But God can proclaim Himself to be worthy of our trust. And as a result of that trust, God and God alone can promise perfect peace. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 4, look at that. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. No one else can make that claim. And, and that's one reason why we're to trust Him. Because of who He is. And, and because of His nature. He 
uh, he possesses and he gives everlasting strength. Uh, don't turn there, but in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4, it says this, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. And it's interesting that in Isaiah 26 and verse 4, when it says that uh, the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength, that word, the, the, those words everlasting strength, that same word in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4 is translated by the word rock. He is not a rock, but he says he is the rock. His work is perfect. Look in uh, chapter 26 in Isaiah in verse 8. He says, Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. Uh, would that be where our desire is? Is that the, the direction of the desires of our heart? Is it to the Lord? If not, then uh, we're going to be lacking in this matter of peace. And uh, I'll just say this, and, and I'll be done here in a minute. <clears throat> That's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, it's fairly easy for us to sit here tonight, for me to stand up here tonight, and to look at these verses and read them and uh, think about trusting in the Lord. The challenge, uh, or at least part of it, <clears throat> part of the challenge that we have as believers uh, to place really unreserved faith uh, in someone that we've never seen. Uh, we, we've read about him. And that's how God has chosen to reveal Himself in His Word. Uh, would it be easier for you to put your trust in someone that you've seen, some man that you have seen that is subject to failure? Or would it be easier for you to put your trust in someone that you've never seen but according to His own revelation about Himself, according to that which He has been pleased to tell us about himself, from that we know that he cannot fail, that he cannot change, that uh, he cannot lie, yet we've never seen him. Uh, wouldn't it be better for us to put our trust in him than in anything else? And that's going to require that we apply the principle that uh, Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. simply says this, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. And really Isaiah 26, 3 would mean nothing to us apart from faith. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because... He trusteth in thee. And there's, there's a lot more that we could think about uh, along these lines, but just, just let, let's conclude by saying this. <clears throat> Begins with trust, because he trusteth in thee. That's where it has to start. Uh, and obviously, that has to start at salvation, doesn't it? That's how we're saved, is by faith. Uh, trusting the promise of God. So that trust, that, that, that faith, that foundation of faith is established in the life. Does that mean that there's perfect peace there? Not yet. Because upon that foundation of faith, we, we need to get to where, uh, get to the place in our lives to where our minds are stayed upon Christ, stayed, fixed, focused. We're, we're solidly uh, zeroed in uh, upon Him. He is our 
uh, focus in life. And then we have the result that is promised there in verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And so uh, let's, uh, let's be challenged by Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Uh, in this day of uh, all kinds of distress of mind, and you, you know, I mean, trouble on every hand. Uh, you know, people uh, by the scores uh, live lives without peace. Some of them even end up taking their own lives because of that. Uh, well, what's the answer? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And let's not look at that verse and say, well, does God really mean that? Uh, there'll never be any peace for us if, if that's our approach. Uh, we must trust Him and we must stay focused and fixed, stayed upon Him. Uh, let's bow for prayer.